did God have any choice in making the universe? Yeah, that's Einstein. I'm quoting Einstein there, but yes, right. You're, you still, you know, chose that phrasing, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. So I'm not going to totally let you off the hook. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, I, I'm very interested in the, in, in the way ideas of God do wend their way in this through different minds and physicists and so forth. But that's a separate conversation, perhaps, that we but could can have. We, can we talk about that for a minute yeah, before we jump to. off yeah. of it? So just, yeah. um, we might as well, we're here. <laughs> yeah. um, I know that that is Einstein's phrasing, and he was confused as being, uh, for being a very religious man when really many people argued, in fact, that was just his uh, elegant way of phrasing it. Um, but do you believe that there is a God making choices in uh, the making of the universe? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, but I can go a little bit further. Look, what's my view? My, my view, which I think many of our colleagues share in one way or another, is that it's astounding how this brain of ours, which evolved so that we could survive in the African savanna, get the next meal, somehow this brain got so good at detecting patterns in the external world and finding the language to encapsulate those patterns, namely the language of mathematics, that we've been able to go so far overboard that we've been able to find patterns that are irrelevant to survival. Patterns in the astrophysical realm, patterns in the microphysical, the quantum realm. This is utterly astounding to me that we are able to do that and, and, and deeply gratifying. Now, could it be that there is some grand designer that is behind all those patterns? Certainly could be possible. But I don't find that answer from a physics standpoint to be particularly interesting because then you sort of stop at that point. What I find interesting is to continue to probe deeply into those patterns for the sake of understanding them intrinsically, to see how far our brains can go to unraveling it all. And that, to me, is really what the scientific enterprise is all about. But unlike some of our colleagues, I find the idea of something beyond the physical, the idea of something that our forebears found deeply compelling to me, I find it extraordinarily interesting to think about and pursue that idea. I don't consider it something that should ultimately be wiped off the face of the earth, as some of our colleagues have explicitly said, because in the end, we're human beings struggling to grasp who we are, how we came to be here, and what can give our lives coherence and meaning. And for some people, relying upon the kind of poetic stories that our forebears wrote down is something that helps them gain a foothold in that project, that project of trying to make meaning and find meaning. And if it works for an individual, more power to them in this world of ours. And so to me, these are dual enterprises that seek ultimately to give us insight into the nature of ourselves and the nature of reality. And we should make use of all stories that we can write down to try to give us a sense of understanding. You say uh, something to the effect that it's important to understand the profound influence of human nature, even in the ostensibly objective realm of science. Yeah. And I believe that's what you're alluding to, which I think is a very organic and complete, more complete and open approach to the pursuit, though. I also like the humanist stance. Yeah. <laughs> um, so back to the scientific sense in which this quote was used. Um, does God have a choice in making the universe? There is a scientific sense in which you're posing that question again. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I Einstein had hoped that the universe would be so singular, so rigid in its structure, that the laws that, say, he was writing down or perhaps the laws that he envisioned one day supplanting the ones that he wrote down, would be uniquely determined, one set of laws, one single, unique, unified reality. And I think many of us in our heart of hearts share that dream. There's something quite compelling about it because if you ask the question, 
why is there a universe, the answer that this approach would give, there had to be. It would be a logical impossibility to not have a universe because the laws themselves are so rigid in their structure that they don't allow for the other possibility of there not being a realm called the universe. So that's this dream that Einstein had. String theory, and actually many developments in modern physics, not just string theory, have taken us pretty far from that vision. And in particular, string theory, we spoke about those extra dimensions. Well, we've learned that the extra dimensions can have many different shapes. When I was a graduate student, only five shapes were known, which is what motivated us back then to investigate them very closely to see if they might give experimental signatures that we could look for. But that was in the 80s. By the 90s, people had found other shapes for the extra dimensions. The number grew to like 10,000 was the number that people would kick around in the 90s. And to make a long story short, certainly by the early 2000s, that number had ballooned to like 10 to the 500 possible shapes, each giving rise to different experimental signatures. And so that is about as far as you can imagine going from a unique universe with rigid rules to a structure that allows for this enormous range of possibilities.